Okay, welcome to uh, chapter one, section two, the chemical basis of life. So when we talk about the chemical basis of life, we need to talk about our big four. Our big four, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen, right? These are the ones we're gonna find the most in our bodies. And when we basically talk about the chemical basis of life, um, we all know that most of our bodies are composed of water right? You're about 70% water. And so when we talk about the different elements, we're excluding that. We're calling this um, the dry weight of a human body. <laughs> Seems kind of strange, but um, so when you look at taking out the water, so not including the water, our most abundant element is carbon. We are carbon-based life forms. That's, that's why we say that. Um, and so 62% of our dry weight is just carbon. That's a lot. Um, it's actually about a hundred times more prevalent in our bodies than it is in the Earth's crust. Um, so it's disproportionately high, which is why we say we're carbon-based, right? Um, but we have three other big ones that we see a lot of, and that's nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. Um, now the other things listed on here are are important. Um, you have ions that are very important in cell signaling, like um, calcium, like sodium. Those are ions that are important in allowing cells to communicate, right? You have metabolites that are super important, um, like cobalt and iron, um, all those kinds of things. So a lot of different chemicals are very important for the proper functioning of our bodies. And a lot of these different components come together to make very common functional groups. And we're going to talk about what those functional groups are today. And when we look at the big overall organization of biochemistry, right, we're going to start with those elements and those functional groups. So that's all the way down here at the bottom. Um, and then we're going to build and we're going to say, okay, if we have these elements in these functional groups, what can we combine them to make? Well, those are going to be our big four biomolecules, our big four, amino acids, nucleotides, sugars, and fatty acids. Those are our big ones. Then what are we going to use those biomolecules for? Well, we can make bigger things, and we call those macromolecules, right? Macro means big. Um, proteins, DNA, RNA, carbs. So carbs are complex sugars, right? Then what happens to those things is what we call metabolism. So are you breaking something down? Are you building something? Um, it's pro a process that occurs in the cell. And then um, where does metabolism occur? It occurs in the cell. And we're gonna talk about some of the components of cells. And then um, because we are eukaryotic, right? We're made up of more than one cell. And so we have organisms, right? We're mammals and all the other things. And then um, the next and the highest part is our ecosystem. And so we're gonna kind of take this this section in that hierarchy of organization. So when we talk about the most common um, things that occur in the cell, well, if carbon is the most common element, then what is carbon doing? Well, we have some very common bonds that occur with carbon. We have a carbon-carbon single bond, carbon-carbon double, um, a carbon-hydrogen single, carbon-oxygen double, carbon nitrogen single, carbon sulfur single, and a carbon oxygen single. Those are our most common carbon bonds. And we know, um, go back to your chemistry, your very, very early chemistry, right? Um, carbon wants to make four bonds because that is four unpaired electrons. And so um, we can do a lot with carbon. So don't forget all of your original beginning chemistry because that's gonna be really important later. All right. So when we, when we talk about the carbon atom making those four single bonds, um, what the most common structure that you're going to see is a tetrahedron, right? And so if you take two of these, these yellow ones are carbon here. So if we take two carbons and we link them via a single bond, so this is a carbon-carbon single bond, what you're going to see is because that's just one single bond, right, you can rotate around that carbon, right? So it can move a lot. But what happens when you convert that single bond into a double bond, you have a sigma and a pi bond. And when you have a sigma and a pi bond, because you have those two, you can't rotate. If you rotated, you would break the pi bond. And so you can't have that rotation. And so anything that has a carbon-carbon double bond all lie in the same plane. And I'm imagining that y'all have probably seen that before. 
Um, so in addition to the very common things that were in that table that we just saw, we have some elements that are trace elements, which means we don't see very much of them inside the body, but they're super important. They're cofactors in proteins, and if you don't get them, you don't survive. So they are required for life. Um, and those are zinc, iron, manganese, copper, cobalt. Iron, y'all know, in hemoglobin, right? You don't need that much of it, but it's essential for life. Um, our essential ions, remember I talked about ions are very, very important, and they're important in cell signaling and in neurophysiology, uh, which is a super interesting topic, and uh, we'll see what we can come back to this year with that. Um, you know about calcium, chlorine, magnesium, potassium, sodium, all of those super, super, super important. You have to be able to recognize the functional groups that we're going to talk about in biochemistry. I'm imagining that you have seen these before. I'm hoping that you've seen these before. So we're going to go over each one very briefly. An amino group. What do you look for in an amino group? You're looking for that nitrogen. Anytime you see a nitrogen, you're going to think amino, right? Hydroxyl, hydrogen, oxygen. So that's the OH here. Uh, then we have sulfhydryl. So we're looking at a sulfur and a hydrogen group. Phosphoryl, we're looking for phosphorus with some oxygens around it, right? Carboxyl, carbon, oxygen, um, but not just carbon, oxygen, you actually have that OH on there. And then the last one is the methyl group. So carbon surrounded by just hydrogens. And we know that this R, right, is telling us that we have more to this molecule. Usually these are functional groups that are just kind of stuck onto another molecule and that do particular things. That's why we call them functional because they, they have a role, they have a job. So we take those functional groups and they're gonna give certain characteristics to our major biomolecules. Nucleic acids, amino acids, simple sugars, and fatty acids. So let's talk about each of those individually. So let's tackle our amino acid first. Here's one example of an amino acid, glycine. Glycine is our most simple amino acid. Uh, it only has um, hydrogen as its functional group, so it has the smallest little attachment there. And amino acids have uh, lots of functions. All of these have multiple functions. Do you have to know them? Yes, absolutely. Um, they are all, they are all required, um, well, they are all able to do some energy conversion. So you can store energy in any one of these molecules. Some are better at it than others, but they can all store it. But when you think about amino acids, I think the number one thing that comes to mind is protein function right? Amino acids are all also part of neurotransmission, so there's neurotransmitters inside the brain. Um, nitrogen metabolism, um, those are the, the big ones. When we look at nucleotides, nucleotides have a particular structure, right? And so when we look at a nucleotide, we're looking for three different things. What's that we're looking for right here? We have, first off, we have our nitrogenous base, right? And then we have our sugar here. And then we have some number of phosphate groups on the end of it. But those are our three pieces that we're looking for whenever we're looking for a nucleotide, right? And nucleotides um, are not just in DNA, so they're not just nucleic acid functions. Um, like we said, they, they can function in energy conversion. Um, signal transduction is a really big one. Um, and, and they're also enzyme catalysts, which is really kind of cool. Uh, simple sugars is another group, right? And you actually have a simple sugar inside of the nucleotide. So it's in energy conversion. That's a big, big, big one for them. Uh, cell wall structure. So like cellulose, right? The thing that, the stuff that keeps um, plant cells from having that particular shape. That's our, uh, that's our starch, things like that. Um, in cell recognition, so a lot of times there are little things that hang out on the outside of the surface of cells, and a lot of times they're composed part partially of simple sugars, sometimes also proteins, but they are um, used for recognition. And um, in nucleotide structure, which is what we just said. All right, the last one is a fatty acid. Fatty acids stores energy very, very well. It's also involved in cell signaling. Um, you can um, use it as a, um, a signaling molecule to trigger a cell to do a particular thing. And they're also found in your cell membranes to keep that, um, to keep that structure and to keep the function 
of your cell membranes. Okay, so let's let's go into these a little bit more detail. Amino acids, right? So it's our nitrogen containing molecule. And this is our building blocks for our proteins, right? And so we know this is glycine because we only have a hydrogen group there. Anytime that you are looking for amino acids, this is going to be the R group and it can change, right? Um, but all of these amino acids can be linked together in a linear chain and that's what forms a polypeptide for a protein. And they differ from one another because of that side chain um, that's attached to the central carbon. So in this case, our side chain is simply hydrogen, but we're gonna talk about all of them. And we're gonna talk about um, how they have different functions and what happens if you substitute them and all kinds of really pretty interesting stuff. So then we're gonna talk about nucleotides, right? These are our nucleic acids, our DNA, our RNA. Some of my favorite molecules, love them. They consist of, like we said, our nitrogenous base. So here's our base, right? Our five ring sugar. And oh, I didn't circle. That's part of it. <laughs> That's your last carbon there. And then a one to three uh, phosphate groups attached to it. And so uh, a lot of times, you know, you're thinking just regular DNA and RNA, but it also includes ATP, cyclic AMP, NAD plus. Um, and we're going to talk about what the function of all those different molecules are, but recognize that it's more than just A, T, C's, and G's. All right, carbs. Carbs are going to contain only carb carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms, and that's it. It's the only thing that they have. And they have a ratio of two to one hydrogen to oxygen atoms. And that's what you're going to see all the time. You're going to see monosaccharides, disaccharides. Um, the difference is however many rings, right? Monosaccharides is only one ring, disaccharides, two rings put together. So glucose over here is a monosaccharide. Fatty acids. Fatty acids are amph amphipatic molecules. So what does that mean? That means that you have um, one side of the molecule that's charged and the other side of the molecule is not charged. And so these act as a component of our plasma membrane right? And um, they allow us to have one portion that's um, happy to be near water and then one portion that does not want to be anywhere near water and it gives us that, um, that nice lipid bilayer inside of our membranes. Um, they also form, um, they also act as storage and uh, in the form of fats and things like that. Um, so you're always gonna see a carboxyl group that's attached to a hydrocarbon chain. And you know that this is a hydrocarbon chain, right? We see 14 here. So this is actually a really, really long um, molecule, but we've shortened the nomenclature there just to make it fit on the screen. All right, so I know you've heard this. What is the difference between saturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids? So when you talk about a saturated fatty acids, saturated, when we talk about saturated, I want you to think hydrogens. In a saturated fatty acid chain, every single carbon has as many hydrogens as possible attached to it. And therefore it cannot have any carbon-carbon double bonds. If it is a polyunsaturated fat, then some of the hydrogens are missing. Well, how's carbon gonna be happy? How's it gonna complete its octet? Well, then it's gonna make carbon-carbon double bonds within the hydrocarbon chain. So whenever you're thinking of saturated and unsaturated, what I want you to think of is hydrogens. Saturated, you are saturated with hydrogens. Unsaturated, you're, you don't have enough hydrogens. And so how are you gonna make up for that? You're gonna put in carbon-carbon double bonds. All right, macromolecules, right? Now we're gonna get bigger. We're going up that pyramid that we saw earlier. So these are our biomolecules that we're kind of putting them together, right? So for example, um, you're gonna take amino acids and you're gonna put them into a chain and that chain is called a polymer. And once we have a long enough chain, we're gonna call it a protein, right? Um, if you take nucleotides, those monomers of nucleotides and you string them together, you're gonna get nucleic acid. You take glucose monomers, glucose molecules, and you link them together, you're gonna to get a polysaccharide. So we're going from um, our biomolecules being monomers to our macromolecules being some kind of a polymer. 
some are longer than others, but they're all polymers. So when we talk about polymers in nucleic acids, this is when we're really gonna focus on. Um, these are covalently linked and it's the same for DNA and RNA, and I'll show you the difference in DNA and RNA in a minute. But the nucleotides are linked together through phosphodiester bonds. And so when you look at that, you need to understand the, the nomenclature of why we name things a five prime, a three prime, right? That kind of stuff. So we always, we always list, so each one of these is a carbon, right? Carbon, 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 carbon. Um, and so this would be our one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime carbon. So why do we call them primes? Because we're trying to differentiate um, from this ring here and our sugar ring. And so we, we use the prime when we talk about the sugar. So you're going to number those carbons so that your side chains, the things that come off and bind to those carbons, have the lowest number possible. And this is, so this is the way that we name them. So our fifth carbon right here is bound to our phosphoryl group, right? And then our three prime carbon is bound here to the phosphoryl group of a previous or a, of a different nucleotide. And so we call this one our phosphodiester bond, right? And so, if we zoom out here, if I can do that. All right, so now we have a chain here of two um, nucleic acids, of um, two nucleotides to make up a nucleic acid with one phosphodiester bond. When we look at linking amino acids to make proteins, right, we have to look at the same thing. So in this case, instead of giving you an actual amino acid, we're just saying it's amino acid one. And so if we put a hydrogen here in place of this R1 group, then that would be glycine, right? Um, but we're saying it could be any amino acid. The side chain doesn't matter for right now. Right now, we're just trying to show the linkage between the different amino acids. So we know we're looking for a nitrogen, carbon, carbon, and an oxygen. That gives us amino acid one. Now we're gonna link amino acid one to amino acid two, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, oxygen. So here, right here, we're looking at our peptide bond. Same thing, we have our nitrogen, carbon, carbon, oxygen. Okay, here's our next one, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, oxygen. And then we have a second, oops, we have a second, peptide bond right there between the carbon and the nitrogen. It's always going to be carbon and a nitrogen, carbon and a nitrogen. Okay. So we call that either a protein or we call that a polypeptide. Either way is cool. Polysaccharides are mixtures of simple sugars, right? You can have repeating units of glucose. And so we call the covalent link between those glucose molecules, we call that a glycosidic bond. And the type of bond is going to tell us information about the chemical properties of that polysaccharide because polysaccharides are very, very different depending on their linkages and they have very different functions. Um, and you can tell that in the difference between starches and, um, and, and other, we'll use some examples in class and, um, and we'll show some, okay? So, so here's, here are some examples in rice, right? Um, we have a different glycosidic bond in rice than we do in cabbage than we do in the exoskeleton of a lobster, right? And so because the linkages are different, um, we're going to see different properties from those polysaccharides. So even though they're linked, they're still um, glucose molecules linked together, um, the place on the sugar molecule where those linkages occur is different and they give it different properties. So now we've got bunches of different biomolecules, right? That made macromolecules. And now we're gonna talk about what happens to those macromolecules in metabolic pathways. Um, in order to survive, right? All cells need a response to energy. Everything needs energy to go, to do. So how are you going to coordinate that? And, um, and that requires 
an interaction of lots and lots of different macromolecules. And so it's all got to function within our membrane bound cells. And you know some examples, you've covered some examples in class, glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, citrate cycle, fatty acid oxidation, and biosynthesis. And we're going to go into those in extensive detail later on in the year. So when we cover them, there's a little bit of terminology you need to know. And those are metabolites. Metabolites are small and they serve as reactants and they serve as products in it in the biochemical reactions. And you gotta think that these metabolic pathways are not just one reaction. They're many, 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 many different reactions linked together. And so depending on where you're looking inside of the pathway, something might be a reactant here, but it's a product there, right? And so we just call them metabolites so that it generalizes them. Um, there's a flux, there's a meta metabolic flux, and this is the rate at which reactants and products are interconverted because most pathways are not a one-way street. Um, usually we're able to take it in both directions. And so why you would want to push a reaction in one direction versus another is super important depending on what's in the environment and how the organism is going to react. And so you have a very interesting metabolic flux depending on, let's say if you just had lunch or if you've been starving for three days, you know, your, your body's going to do different pathways and um, in different orders. Okay. So here's our example, the urea cycle. So if we look at our metabolites, our metabolites up here, right? We have citrulline, we have aspartate. So what's gonna happen is that we have a chain of reactions occurring. It's not a one step, it's multiple steps. Now this is super simple, we're only taking two steps here. The first one is a condensation reaction where we're gonna take these two metabolites and we're gonna hook them together. Now this requires energy. So we're gonna have ATP and we're gonna hydrolyze it. We're gonna go from ATP to AMP plus an inorganic phosphate, right? A pyrophosphate, because it's actually two um, phosphates. So that's what's gonna drive the reaction forward, but that reaction isn't gonna go if we don't have an enzyme. So the enzyme that's required to do that is the arginosuccinate synthase. So how do you know? I love how they name enzymes, I really do. I think it makes so much sense. So look at the product. What's the product of this condensation reaction? The arginosuccinate. So why not just put synthase after that? Okay, that's the name of the enzyme. Yeah, it's so smart, I love it. Okay, so we, we've made our intermediate in this metabolic pathway, right? But is that our goal? No, the goal was to make arginine. So what we now need to do is we now need to cleave our intermediate molecule in order to make the products that we want. So once we have that cleavage reaction occur, right? Um, and the cleavage is a little bit, is a little bit interesting because the, agree, the amino group from the aspartate is transferred to the citrulline, right? And so now we make two different products. Now we have arginine and we have fumarate. And so um, you can see that these, this is indicative of multiple steps in order to get to one product. You're going to see this a lot, a lot, a lot, because it's, it's too hard to do. You can't just hook on a, a free molecule here, right? You have to get it from somewhere. And so this is why we have to go through different steps. And so, so what you'll notice is the difference between our product here, arginine, right, and our reactant metabolite up here, the only difference is right there on the molecule. Everything else is exactly the same. But that's just one example from one reaction. So a lot of times your metabolic pathways are way more complex. And so this is even a simplified version of the complexity of metabolic pathways. But you can have linear pathways. And you can have linear pathways in two different ways. You can have linear pathways that are one direction. So over here, you're using up ATP. So once you shift over to B, you're stuck in B. You can't go back to A. Or you could have a reversible reaction where you're going from B to C. Well, B to C, once you make C, you can very easily go back to B because it didn't require ATP. So it could be reversible or non-reversible. 
You can have a forked pathway where you have um, one reactant and you're going on to make two products and those two products actually participate in completely different um, downstream metabolic pathways. Um, and then you can also have a cyclic pathway. And so we'll, we'll see plenty of examples of all of them, I promise. All right, so we've got all of our metabolism going on. Where is that metabolism occurring? It's occurring inside of a cell. So we have some different cellular structures. And if you remember back to biology 101, right? Um, we have prokaryotes and we have eukaryotes. How can we tell the difference? Well, we know if we look at these pictures, right? Over here, right, on this side, we're looking at prokaryotes. Prokaryotes like bacteria, right? And on the other side, we have eukaryotes. How can you tell just by looking? Well, your prokaryotes don't have membrane-bound organelles. That's a really big um, <laughs> giveaway there. So if you look at the animal and the plant cell, what you can see, which is, should be glaring, is right here in the middle, we're looking at a nucleus. It's a good giveaway. So we have two different eukaryotic uh, cells here. On the left, we have an animal. On the right, we have a plant. Um, you can tell the difference because the plant there has a very rigid cell wall, and so it maintains that, that structure, that shape, whereas the animal cell does not. Um, but you do need to kind of generally know the functions of the different um, organelles within the cell. And you should be able to tell the difference between prokaryote and eukaryote. You know, prokaryotes do have that cell wall. They do have that... that um, outer thick layer on the top of their, on the outside of their uh, plasma membrane. But their nucleus, I'm sorry, but their DNA is all over in the cytoplasm, right? There's, there's not one container of DNA, it's all over. Whereas you see the opposite in eukaryotes. So you kind of do need to know your different ones. Um, so we'll go over them super quickly. Um, all of the DNA inside of the cell is going to be referred to as the genome, right? It has all the genes that are encoded for. It has other um, things that help the cell to know when to transcribe, what to transcribe, how often to do it. Um, so it's our genetic composition, both eukaryotic, eukaryotic and prokaryotic. Now inside the nucleus, so now we're talking about just eukaryotic, we have the nucleolus. The nucleolus is the site of ribosome assembly. So we're gonna start to um, move our information from being in DNA to being in proteins. And our ribosome assembly, once they're assembled, they're going to be the location of protein synthesis. Your mitochondria, how many times have you heard? Powerhouse of the cell, right? responsible for our energy, our ATP production. We have periaxosomes and lysosomes. Those are um, your trash bins. They're involved in degradation, detoxification. They get rid of junk we don't want. The ER, the, the endoplasmic reticulum, um, is there to sequester ribosomes for protein synthesis, right? You have the Golgi, which is in, involved in protein movement from one place to another, and protein secretion in the plasma membrane. So um, sending proteins where they need to go. So because we are multicellular, we get to specialize our cells, which is really awesome. And it gives us that higher complexity. And we can actually exploit our environment through signal transduction. And if, if when you're reading the textbook, I really like this textbook, um, they, they talk about how um, we became eukaryotic, right? And what we think happened was that um, one cell basically ate another cell and that cell continued to survive inside the other cell. And it was a symbiotic relationship, right? Um, it was able to produce energy, it got a nice home, um, and so, being able to do that and then being able to um, become multicellular organisms is super, super interesting. So now that we are multicellular, um, how do we have a signal transduction? How do we communicate from cell to cell? Well, all of this is mediated through receptors. Well, not all, but most of the time it's mediated through receptors. So you have some kind of a ligand, and here our ligand is this, this pink circle over here. And um, it could be a metabolite, it could be a hormone, 
but it also could actually be something that's stuck on the outside of another cell. Maybe it's a bacterial cell, right? Um, it could be on the surface of any other cell. Um, so it could be a variety of different things. I don't want you to think it, it can only be a, a detached molecule of some kind. It can actually still be attached to another cell. And so um, you have this protein that is sitting on the outside of the surface of the cell and it spans the membrane. So it goes all the way across the membrane into a second portion of the molecule. And if there's no receptor present in this, and there's no ligand present in the receptor, then there's no signal. Nothing's going on. It's status quo, right? But then the ligand binds. Let's say the ligand concentration goes up. So then ligands bind. They cause a conformational change that gets propagated all the way down the molecule. So now we went from the square shape to a circle shape, and this is our active form. So maybe some ions are transported across the cell membrane. Uh, maybe it activates a downstream enzyme. Maybe it starts protein synthesis. And the list goes on and on and on. And let's say that the ligand now, the concentration of ligand now decreases, and so the ligand's released, and there's so little of it that it doesn't bind anymore, right? So now we're back to our original status quo, and we have no signal. Right, so we're not inducing. So this is how we can have a signal transduction. And signal transduction is so super important in multicellular organisms because they're so large and there's so much going on that we need a way to communicate and say, hey, we're really hungry. Um, hey, we just ate something. Hey, uh, we're running and we need a lot more oxygen, right? Different things, all kinds of different things. And so organisms, this is our last one, uh, not our last one, <laughs> we're getting close. Uh, but this is the last part of one entire living thing, right? So this consists of all of our specialized cells. And if you take um, like a physiology, anatomy and physiology, we know it goes from cells um, to tissues, to organs, to organisms. So there, there's even more layers in there. But um, this is what allows us to respond to environmental changes, right? If we have this signal transduction mechanism, we can communicate with all the cells of our body, hey, it's hot outside, you need to start sweating so that our bodies don't overheat, right? All kinds of different information has to be going on. Uh, your book had this really nice little picture of all the different, it's not all the, but it's a lot of different things that, um, that are required for this communication to work. Um, if you think about like the liver, right? This is the metabolic control center of the body. So did you just eat? Have you not eaten in a while? Your liver sends out hormones throughout the bloodstream in order to tell the body what's going on. Um, all kinds of different things like that. Um, the kidneys, right? Uh, the kidneys can tell you um, if you're becoming dehydrated, those kinds of things. The heart, if the heart needs to pump faster because you're running somewhere. You're late to class, you need to get there in a hurry because you need to get through the screening now at every, every time you come to campus, right? Okay, so now we've got a bunch of different organisms they all have to interact within an ecosystem. They all have to cohabitate. They all have to find a way to work together in the same environmental niche, right? Um, we have to share our resources. We have to figure out how to properly um, remove waste. So I don't know if you've, you've heard of this, um, but this is an algal bloom here. So depending on the environmental conditions, if they become really, really great for algal growth, um, it can actually, I think this one was actually taken in Maine, um, it can actually use up the oxygen inside of the water. And so if the fish don't have oxygen inside the water, they're very, 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 very unhappy and they start dying. And so you'll, you'll see in places where you have these big algal blooms is the, the next thing that happens is you, you have these massive fish deaths. And, um, and so you have to have a balance, um, not too much, not too little of anything. All right, that's the end of 1.2. See you next time.